All right, let's see how quickly this gets going here. Come on, YouTube. Anybody out there, feel free to comment. We'll see if this is <laughs> this starting or not. All right, looks like we're going in live. I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com, and welcome to another live video here on YouTube. Today, I thought this would be a very fun and entertaining and interesting lesson, especially for a lot of people who would like to think more in English. And the reason to do this is because it stops you from tra uh, translating, hesitating, those kinds of things. Uh, I'm going to show you why it's possible for you to do this, that this really is easier than most people think. Uh, and we're going to talk about five laws. Uh, I really call them laws because if you follow them, it's almost automatic that you will think more in English. And if you don't follow them, you will not. So it's pretty simple. All right. Uh, also, uh, apologies because I was not here yesterday. I thought uh, I would be doing this yesterday, but uh, I was wrong. <laughs> anyway, even, you know, I'm, I'm wrong sometimes, I guess. But hopefully everyone is doing well. Feel free to post a comment. Uh, let me know how you are doing. This should be pretty easy to understand. These are actually the same principles I use in all of the videos that I make, all the lessons that I make. These are the things I'm thinking about. Uh, but I thought this would just be a really good, uh, really good chance to explain all of these things in a simple way that anybody can understand. You can start applying this yourself. You don't have to uh, think about anything special because your brain is doing this already. Uh, so let's get into it. All right, let me make sure. All right, I think, yeah, comments. I'll check comments uh, in a moment, make sure those are doing fine. Uh, let's see. All right, so before we get into uh, the lesson, I just want to explain uh, about thinking in English, why it's possible to do this, uh, why people don't usually do this, uh, and that will lay the foundation for these five laws that we're going to cover. Uh, but very quickly, let me see if anybody had any questions. Arthur, oh, nice to see you there. Mohammed, can you suggest me tips or techniques to enhance my speaking? Well, yes, that's what we'll be talking about on this uh, video. Uh, Nils, nice to see you from Wisconsin. Eldar, nice to see you there. Good listening to you this morning. Glad to hear it. All right, well, let's get into the party. Uh, this should be, again, an entertaining video. So first of all, I'll, the, the, the basic idea uh, is that your brain is already following these laws automatically. You're doing these things in your native language. And we know you're doing these things in your native language because it's just kind of naturally how the brain operates. It's not just for languages. We really apply these laws uh, to everything, but we're just talking about them specifically for languages. And I've heard, uh, like some people might say, well, it's, it's more difficult to think of a new word in English because you already have a word for something in your native language. Uh, I talk about this, but really the truth is uh, most people have multiple words for particular things. Like in English, we've got many ways of talking about money uh, or different ways of talking about many different things. We can actually, that's part of one of the laws we'll talk about uh, in this video, how you can describe things in different ways. Um, so this isn't a reason to stop you from being able to speak uh, or learn and think all in English because you're doing this already. Uh, and even further, uh, rather than only maybe trying to have uh, like different ways of describing words, you would have whole ways of speaking that are different. So you might speak to children in your native language in a way that's different than you would speak to adults, or you have a formal way of speaking or a not formal way of speaking, or you have a way of talking or the vocabulary you would use for your profession that people outside of that profession would not know. And you learn all of these things the same way, all in your native language. So it's really like you're actually knowing and using multiple languages already and if you simply apply that same thinking, the same laws that your brain is using, the same automatic things your brain is doing, if you apply those to English, then you will think, uh, think and speak with, uh, without hesitating and translate. All right? So it should be pretty simple. Uh, if people want to talk about, talk about TPRS technique, I don't know what that is. But you can, uh, if you if you want to tell tell me more about what that is, uh, I, I try not to confuse people uh, or worry about like particular techniques. It's really just uh, what we're going to get into right now, which is either you're learning English as a first language, 
or you're learning it as a second language. And this is where really the foundation or the heart of the thinking in your native language and translating where that comes from. So the goal, uh, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, so in your native language, you probably have multiple ways of describing the same thing, and you also use different ways of talking for different situations, again, professionally, casually, with children, those are just different examples. But the main point is that you can either do something within the language itself, or you can try to cross over from one language to the other one. And so really the goal, if you want to think in English, you need to learn in English because how we learn is how we speak, all right? So uh, the typical way that people are learning, like let's say this is your, your native language, I'll just use Japanese as an example. Uh, that's not fitting up there, but the J right there. Uh, so Japanese is your native language, for example, and this is English over here. And so if you're trying to learn English, typically people will begin by thinking about something in their native language, in Japanese, and then they will have a word uh, and then try to translate that way. So you're going from one language to another one. So if you learn that way, again, you will be thinking that way when you try to speak. So when you want to speak, uh, you will have to think about those same things in your native language and then translate them in your head. So the goal is really to learn everything within the language itself. Okay, that's the, the, like the core foundational idea of this. And as I just said, you're doing this already, okay? You already have multiple ways of describing things, even multiple words for the same thing. Like in English, we talk about money or cash or bones or greenbacks or frog skins or different ways of talking about cash. Uh, and so that's the same object, but we actually describe it in different ways. So this is one of the laws we'll get to in a moment. But if you apply that same thinking just to English, so the same things that you're already doing in your native language, if you apply these same laws to English, then you will start thinking more in English and then speaking more fluently. All right, hopefully everybody gets that. Let me check comments before we get into these actual laws over here. Uh, but this should be, let's see, all right. I right, really appreciate your efforts, sir, says Kay, and it says, looking forward to seeing today's lesson. Glad to hear it. Vocabulary is somehow lacking in my case, said Leah. Uh, yeah, so pretty much all of the problems that people have will be solved by this, all right? So it's really just learning everything through your native language. So you're, again, you're, you're beginning with your native language and trying to translate as you learn something in English. So you have a word you want to say in your native language, and then you translate that into English or you just learn it all in English, okay? So very easy, I'll show you how this works, all right? So just uh, again, as I talk about this, usually we'll call this uh, learning English as a second language and then learning English as a first language over here. And so all of the laws, again, I really want to repeat this again and again, just so people believe me, they know it's possible, they're doing it already, I just want you to do it with English rather than only the things in your native language. All right, so let's talk about the five laws. This is actually very simple. You will see these are all connected uh, and they do build off of each other, but I teach them in this order, or I'd like to cover them in this order uh, because I think it's a little bit easier to understand how we learn new things and then expand on our understanding. So we expand upon our understanding of words as we learn the native way. All right, let's see here. Yes, code switching, we talked about that before in a previous video. Marcia says, I'm your, I'm from Brazil. God bless you, thanks, it's my pleasure, glad to hear it. Mom, it says, learning by storytelling. What do you think about TPRS? I don't know, someone tell me what that means. <laughs> I've heard of that, but I uh, actually have not, well, I've heard, I've heard TPRS, but I don't know what that refers to. But again, I, I try to keep it simple. It's just either you're learning things in English or you're trying to translate as you learn them, all right? So the goal is really to apply these laws the same way you're doing that already in your native language, but just to English. All right, uh, Bridget says, nice to see you there, George. Hello, MC. My goal is to think in English. Hope it arrives one day. Well, it does. Today is the day. Now that's it. Uh, Wagner, nice to see you from Brazil. All right, I usually complicate my way of talking. Well, you can be more specific about that, any of uh, But hopefully this should simplify your way of talking by removing steps like thinking and translating from when you talk. 
as I can say, a uh, low watch with subtitle, with or without subtitle. Uh, it doesn't matter. I think if you if you need subtitles, that's fine to use them, and they are good for checking your understanding. So that's, a, that's perfectly fine to do. Hello, guys. I'm from RDC. I appreciate your teaching. Glad to hear. And Pablo says, what's the difference between... Uh, I hope to learn much English from you, and I hope I am going to learn much English from you. Both ways of them correct. Yeah, both of those are fine. Jose said, uh, my technique to improve my fluent English speech is reading a lot is correct. I think it is correct because it is the manner I can get the culture and acquisition of the language. Uh, reading is a part of developing fluency and understanding, but remember that... Uh, uh, if you're only trying to understand things, then reading can help. But if you need to communicate quickly and also like follow what other people are saying, you really need exposure to lots of different native speakers. Uh, so this is how you become used to the faster speed and the different accents and the various vocabulary. So various uh, idioms or slang, other ways of expressing things. So we'll talk a little bit about that in this video. But you need all of that exposure. So you can learn a lot from reading, but you learn a lot more when you also have all of these influences, these different examples, the exposure to native English. All right, so let's get into it. So the first law, we have the law, the law of association. All right, so this is really the core, the foundation of really just all learning in general. What humans are really trying to do is make connections with different things. So we begin by making uh, certain associations you might have. Uh, just as a very quick example, I was uh, many years ago living in a different part of Japan. I was in Kyoto. Uh, and I met a woman, she had kind of a, like a sour, she looked like she looked like she was eating a lemon all the time. She had kind of like an angry, kind of like a, you know, like a, like a face like this. And her name was Sawa. Uh, and I said, oh, like she looks like she's eating like a sour lemon. So it helped me remember her name. So this is just one example of like a natural association, a connection that we make, rather than me just trying to force myself to remember something uh, like you know, trying to repeat it many times and trying to, again, force myself to remember that thing, which is the typical way of learning. So we're going to tell a, tell a student, here's the word, we want you to remember it, but the brain doesn't work that way. The brain works by making associations, and we do this naturally. So what I want you to start doing, if you are not doing this already, and again, uh, rather than trying to think of a word in, uh, in your native language and then trying to translate that, we would really want to learn something all in English, and then make as many associations or connections with that thing as possible. The other laws will also be applying the same idea of association because everything is really just about making connections anyway, uh, but hopefully the, the five ways I describe this should make it a bit easier to understand and maybe a bit easier to, to apply. Again, you are already doing this naturally in your native language. I'm just really reminding you that you're doing it and encouraging you to apply it to learning English. All right, hopefully this makes sense. So if we take a word, uh, let's say, uh, let's say exasperated, exasperated. Exasperated, exasperated. Now, what we want to do when we learn a word like this, you might not know this word, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but what we want to do is again, keeping, keeping the word like inside, English. Rather than trying to take something uh, where if we don't know what the word is, okay, now we need to learn it and understand what it is first in our native language and then translate it into English. We don't want to do that. We want to understand it. And typically, if we, if we can't, if, like I, I just gave an example before using a mnemonic. So a mnemonic is a, like a, a memory aid where you're trying to make a connection that helps you remember something. Uh, but if you just learn a new word, I want you to really try to draw on as many connections and associations as you can by understanding things from the context or the situation. So let's say uh, I'm at home, uh, I am uh, trying to take care of my babies, I've got two babies sitting in high chairs, I'm trying to feed them dinner, uh, and the dog is running around the house, 
uh, and I've got two other kids running, uh, like hanging on the ceiling fan and they're causing a mess. And I have things in the kitchen. Something is about to boil over. I'm getting very, uh, like very uh, excited and I'm really, really getting frustrated. I'm getting, ah, uh, I feel exasperated. Okay. I feel very, very, uh, very, very stressed out, very, very irritated. And the emotional connection of this, I can feel it. Oh, oh this is an exasperating situation. Okay. So I want you to make connections with the word, try to connect with the uh, as many associations or make as many associations as you can. And this is why it's so important to connect vocabulary with situations rather than connecting vocabulary with words in your native language. Okay, so if we want to think in English, we need to recall that situation. Oh, wow, like I remember when I was, uh, I was standing in line uh, and I had to wait, to, I was at a government office and I wanted to get a new driver's license. So I filled out some forms and I waited in line for 20 minutes and I got to the, the front of the line and I was very happy and I said to the lady, look, here's my form. And she said, no, this is incorrect. You have to, you forgot to fill in this other thing. And I said, okay, let me do it here. And she said, no, no, you have to go back to the back of the line again. So fix the form, go back, go to the back of the line and then wait again. And then you can come in and, and we'll try to like take care of your license stuff. And I was already pretty angry, uh, but I went back and okay, I, I fixed the form and I went back and I waited in line. And then I have to go uh, all the way through that. And I said, okay, look, I've got it. I finished the, the line uh, or finished waiting through the line. And I showed her the paper again. And she said, oh no, like there's another error on the paper. And I was like, I was, I was like, now I'm feeling exasperated. I'm very irritated. I'm very tired. I'm very frustrated, very angry. I'm exasperated. I'm like really, really angry. She wants me to go to the back of the line. And like after I've filled out this thing, because she made a mistake, she forgot to tell me that I didn't notice this other error on the paper. Okay. So I've gone through the line two times already and she wants me to go through a third time. And now I'm like, ah, and I just get angry and I leave. I'm so exasperated. I just go home. Okay. So uh, from the story I'm telling you, this is a way of understanding it within English itself. You really understand like, like and, and again, the goal of doing this, just like all the, the things that I teach here, uh, is trying to remove the doubts you have that stop you from speaking. Because if you don't really know what something means or you don't really understand when you should use it or if you don't know how to pronounce it, that will stop you from using that vocabulary. Okay, and that's why a lot of people who learn English as a second language, they translate and they think about things in their native language and try to move that into English. That's why they get stuck because they have doubts about things. They don't really feel confident enough about the language. Maybe they could recognize it if they have uh, someone else tell them the word, but uh, the process is actually very exasperating for people because they've been studying English for a long time and they still can't use the language fluently. Okay, so exasperated. Yes, you can just look up a definition of the word, but I encourage you not to do that. When you hear a word, you hear something new, you should be trying to make associations. Look at the situation, try to make some kind of emotional connection with that thing. Understand why people are saying that word, where it comes from, and that's going to help you understand it all in English. Okay. Remember, you probably learn new words in English that are part of your language in the same way that words in Japanese, like uh, tsunami, for example, that's an English word. So that's a word borrowed from Japanese, tsunami. So if I tell you like, oh, look, look at that, there's like a big tsunami coming. Like people know what that means in English and their brain doesn't recognize that as a Japanese word, even though it is. All right, so it's, it's all psychological. It's just your brain making a connection between like, am I learning it and understanding it directly or am I learning it through another, another word or another language, okay? So if like tsunami, I'll, I'm gonna teach you like a very quick uh, Japanese lesson here. So this is like a tsunami, oh my goodness. And there's a person standing down here. Uh-oh, like the tsunami is going to get this guy. Uh, but this person over here is looking at just like a regular nami. Nami. So we have a tsunami and a nami over there. So nami just means a wave. All right. But this tsunami over here is like, what? It's a giant wave. Okay. 
So when you're learning things like that, if you understand it within the language itself, you're not trying to make any translations or get definitions of the word. You really want to make associations that help you understand the word. And so that's why we begin with association. This is how we start learning new things all in English and making sure uh, we really understand what words mean. All right. Yes, I apologize. I know my drawing is not the best. I'm trying to do it quickly. <laughs> all right, let me look at uh, comments to see if anybody gets this or if they're not getting this. Uh, I really want to make sure people understand this idea because you can do this by yourself. Your brain is doing this automatically. You're always trying to make connections. But if you break this law and you try to learn through definitions or even worse, you try to use translations, that's what's going to cause you to think and translate when you speak. Okay, so if you learn in English and you understand in English, you will connect directly with the language and use the language automatically. All right, hopefully everybody's getting it. And so as you get more examples of this word, it will also help you understand it even better. All right, C says, good morning, your faithful follower. Bruno says, love your content a lot. I used to watch your videos when I started learning English. I was preparing for my job interview and made it. Uh, glad to hear it. I'm working there for seven years now. Thank you so much. Yeah, good work. You did it all by yourself, Bruno. Nice work. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Nilan says, uh, what comes first, reading or listening skill? Uh, I don't know. You could do both of those at the same time. You don't necessarily need to do one or the other, but typically you combine them. If you think about how a child learns, a child would be listening first, uh, but you have the advantage of being an adult who could learn and uh, learn to read and also get like listening practice at the same time. Lewis says, give me tips on what to listen to while I work out. You should watch my videos. Listen to those. All right. Ildu says, uh, look, Drew, I saw the video there where UK helicopter pilot politely say BS. The situation recognized me like bullshit. Exactly. Ah, the moment works good. Thank you. <laughs> good there. Uh, Nils says, do I have any pets? Uh, no, I do not. I used to have uh, quite a few little pets that would like, what did I have? Uh, like frogs and hamsters and lizards and chameleons. I had two iguanas, some turtles, lots of stuff. All right, so exasperated, like if you, if you it, exasperated, like part of it is like you're, you're exhausted, but you're also really frustrated. So you're, you're kind of angry. Now you're getting really frustrated. Now you're just exasperated. It's just like, oh, like uh, you're, you're, you're mentally going crazy. Uh, because you're just so you're so angry about a particular situation. All right, Lucas says no guts, no glory. Demis says Brazil is in the house. Yes, Milton, thanks for the explanation. I thought in a totally different meaning for exasperated. Yes. Uh, so again, this is why we want to get more or more examples of it. We want to see people in exasperating situations. If we see someone who is exasperated, you know that we like see like ah they're going crazy. We actually learn the word and understand it the same way a native does. And that's how I use it fluently. Okay, so you understand it fluently, you can use it fluently. Uh, yes, MC says, we have the same word in my native language, I guess, what it means, obviously. Yes. So if you're coming from a language like French or Spanish or other, other languages that are similar, sim the same thing, like if you're coming from uh, Chinese to Japanese, a lot of the meanings of the characters are the same, and so it makes it easier for people to understand. Uh, hello, says Teresa. Uh, how can I share this live? I'm back. You are the best. Thank you. Uh, I, well, I don't know. Just use your social media, I guess. Take the link of the URL and post it there, I guess. I, I don't know what, what you do with it. <laughs> I should probably know that. Niraj says, Namaste from India. Uh, Brazilian is in the building. Yes, lots of Brazilians over here. Bruno says, Salve. Oh, okay, you guys are speaking to each other. I found the word outrage isn't easy to use. Well, I mean, no word is like intrinsically, so by itself, easy or hard to use. It's just, do you understand the word well or, well or not? So you could be outraged by a particular thing. Like you see a, a man kicking like a little kitten down the street. <laughs> And you're like, ah, I'm outraged by that. You know, I, like I feel like I feel a lot of rage. Like you think about the rage, the anger that you feel, and it's just it's coming out. I'm out. I'm outraged by that particular thing. So it just means you're incredibly angry. But if you look at people, you know, going to protests or whatever, and they're like they're yelling like this, ah, they're outraged. Usually outraged about something, or I'm outraged by you know some some particular situation. So if you're feeling 
unsure, again, if you have doubts about vocabulary, get more examples of those things. And again, the point is to build more associations rather than just try to translate the word, okay? So we want to find more associations to really understand something all in English rather than try to take something like a translation through our native language. All right, let's see. Adriana says, uh, nice draw sounds like Da Vinci. Yes, everything you do and you choose daily has a response in the future. Yes, that's correct. All right, Neil says, I love your examples. Glad to hear it. Uh, an anime too. Let's see, we can also make a connection with a short story. Yes, like I just did. So I, I'm, I'm actually in a very good mood. But if I, let's say I'm, you, you could watch me in a video and I slowly start to get more frustrated or angry, like if there's loud noises around me and I, I lose my calm and I start getting, I'm getting very exasperated. Like, oh, I'm, it's just, it's exasperating. I'm so tired of like listening to these people. There's construction noise or something like that, and it's really frustrating the video. That's where we get that feeling of exasperation from. So I can describe myself as being exasperated, or I can feel something like that. So as many situations or, as, or examples as you need to really understand that thing, all in English. But if you begin with a translation, you are going to think through a translation when you speak. So that's why, again, I call these laws because if you break the law, then that's when you think in your native language. You follow the law, that's when you start thinking in English. All right, Neilton says, thanks. Oh my God, I'm late, says Nicholas. Yes, better late than never. Kate, the nice to see you there. Brett, nice to see you there too. Hi, uh, blue sky, good morning, I'm late. Huggins says, when our brain automatically translate everything that we need in our second language, we're gonna start being fluent the language. No, you're not going to do that. You're, you're trying to do it faster. <laughs> so just like trying to translate faster is not the way to, to do everything. The point is to make it easier for your brain. Your brain doesn't want extra work. Your brain is lazy. Your brain is trying to make associations to help you understand things and you make it more difficult for your brain when you translate. Okay. So again, this is breaking the law. Don't break the law. You will exasperate your brain if you break the law and it will be more difficult for you to communicate if you try to translate. Okay, you can force yourself to do this, but it's much, much easier if you just learn things all in English. All right. All right, Juliet says, hi, Iswar, nice to see you. How you doing? Uh, in your opinion, how many words are uh, necessary to speak English as a second language? One. You only need to know one word to speak fluently and that's it. Uh, and I've talked about this in other videos. The basic idea is that you get fluent word by word, just like we've shown with the word exasperated. So I can teach you one word like exasperated. And if you don't know any other words, but you understand what that means, then you're fluent in that word. And then you just need to build a, a larger vocabulary, but it depends on who you're speaking with. So maybe you're speaking with kids and they have a smaller vocabulary, but they're still speaking fluently. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, don't look for a particular number of words. The more important thing is how well you understand things, and that comes from how you learn, all right? All right, I am from India. Is there a share? There's a share button in the bottom of this video. Uh, oh, okay, well, great. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe it depends if you're, if you're on uh, YouTube. Yeah, there's a share button on YouTube. I don't know if it's on mobile or not. Uh, did I still need recite basically awards? I don't know what that means, Sean. Saudi and Nas Raphael, hey Drew, folks uh, get exasperated over phrasal verbs when they learn them as ESL. Yes, that's often what happens to people. So it becomes really frustrating and this exasperated feeling, everybody knows what this is like. They've experienced it in their own life in some way and many people have experienced it as language learners. All right, if we don't have any more questions about this, Milton says, can you teach us any method of learning new words, memorize it easily, some tool? That's what I'm doing with this. All right, so the, be the beginning thing, uh, this video is it's also about learning vocabulary, uh, but it's about learning grammar, learning pronunciation, and all of these things come from following these laws. But the core one, the foundation of the whole thing is association. Remember, your brain is doing this naturally already, and all you have to do is apply that to learning English. So instead of trying to think about things through your native language, just apply these laws. If the brain wants to learn through associations, let it learn through associations, but just do it in English. 
So when you're learning something new, if it's a completely new word, uh, even if it's a word maybe you've heard before, you really want to make connections with that thing in English, connect with the situation itself, rather than trying to make a connection. So this is forcing a connection, uh, like a translation is an association, but it's a bad one because you may, it basically forces you to think about translations when you speak. So if you don't want to translate when you speak, there's only one option left, make associations in English, okay? All right, I think everybody's getting it though. All right, XDL back again. I'm about to buy a new phone, iPhone 15 or 14, because I'll get some money package for Chinese New Year. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Hopefully you can play Call of Duty on that phone. All right, let's continue with law number two. Law number two. Again, you've probably, uh, maybe you can even guess some of these because I do apply these things in all of the lessons I teach, but I wanted to just lay them all out for people so they, they can really understand these things themselves. You can just really ask yourself, are you doing these things as you learn? All right. Let me write this better. I can't, I'm really, I'm going to write this clearly for people. This is the law of substitution. The law of substitution, S-U-B-S-T-I-T-U-T-I-O-N, substitution. The law of substitution states that there is usually more than one way to express something. And so what we want to do is as soon as we begin making connections, we want to make further connections to make that vocabulary even stronger and to understand different ways of applying things in that same situation. So learning further vocabulary we might use to say something. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to the ESL versus ESL connection here because it's really important. This is especially important for learning uh, substitution. And it's the, the fewer connections that you give to your brain, the better. So when your brain is trying to think of something, if you have like a chain of connections, like this thing leads to that thing leads to that thing, it really slows down your, your mental process and makes it more difficult for you to think and then speak. So if I have to think of something and then I make it an association with this other thing and then this other thing and then this other thing over here and then this other thing, like the distance from here to here, that's going to take me a long time to process that. So mentally, I would be thinking about this thing like a translation then something in English and something else. So I'm making these, these kind of different loops over here. Uh, and so usually what happens is like, like you will learn a word, let's say a word like beautiful as an example. One of the first words that people are learning when they're learning English as a second language. So they learn a word like beautiful. Wow, that is a very beautiful woman or that is a beautiful car or beautiful sunset or you know whatever you're going to describe something. So people will typically begin with a word in their native language. Uh, as an example in Japanese, it might be like kire, uh, kire as an example. So there are different ways of describing this. I don't want to make this a Japanese lesson, but just so I, I just give you an example. So we begin with a word in your native language and then we learn the word beautiful. And then if we want to think of a different word, uh, typically we will think of like there's some other like related word in our native language, and then we try to think about that word as well. I, I'm, I really want to make this very clear and simple because uh, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to understand how our brain is working, and we make it more complicated by thinking through our native language. So as an example, we begin... Uh, Let's see. I, I don't want to use Japanese as an example, actually. Let, let's just say I'm going to use like an alien language, so nobody knows what these words are. Uh, but you begin with a language, uh, an alien language, it just means like om, and om in English means beautiful, as an example. So om means beautiful, but let's say we don't want to say beautiful, we want to say something else. All right. So instead of thinking in English about other ways we could uh, express that, so other substitutions for that thing, we try to think of like, uh, we'll say, uh, uh, cut. So uh, cut in the alien language also means beautiful, but it's slightly different. Okay. And it becomes more complicated because we're trying to think about these different things, the relationship of these things, and translate that into English. And we don't want to do that. Instead, we want to understand everything all in English. So we begin with a word like beautiful, and then we think about how are the different ways we might describe something. 
And so we get that from, again, connecting with the situation and then seeing how those things might, like other people might uh, say those things in English. So let's say I'm describing a beautiful sunset because a beautiful sunset is, it's really a different situation than describing a beautiful car or a beautiful woman. We would actually use slightly different vocabulary uh, if we're talking about these things. Uh, I think somebody, Nicholas just said cute. So cute is uh, quite different from beautiful. And you learn that not by trying to get a translation, but by understanding examples within English itself. So looking at situations, and the situation is the key. So I'm really trying to get people to connect things, the English language with situations, rather than the English language with your language, okay? So we begin by associating things. Now we want to extend that by making substitutions because this is how native speakers are advancing uh, like into new ways of talking about things or more nuanced ways or even just different ways of describing exactly the same thing. So I want to see, just with the help of the chat here, can you think of some different ways we might describe a beautiful sunset? All right, so pretty, Monica says pretty. Now, just to compare these things, pretty is, is, is a little bit lower, if you, if you want to say kind of at a lower level, like if you, in, like we could contrast this with women as well, like a pretty woman and then a beautiful woman is like, it's gonna be like a higher level of, of kind of like, like attractiveness or whatever. So we talk about amazing. So these are different ways of describing a beautiful sunset, wonderful. So we could talk about how it looks, or we could be talking about how it makes us feel, okay? So in these examples, like the sunset itself is pretty, or gorgeous, that's another good example, mesmerizing, breathtaking, all right? Some good examples of that thing over here. So let's say I go to a, like a scenic area. So I'm driving, and I, and I drive over here, and I see, I get out of my car, uh, and there are actually quite a few people over here. So looking at this, uh, this is like the sea over here and the beautiful sun going down, and they're each describing it in a slightly different way. They're each describing it in a slightly different way. So one person might say amazing, that's an amazing sunset, or another person might say like captivating, like it captured me, captivate. Captivate, captivate. So a captivating or arresting, something like that. Yes, you could talk about it being unbelievable. And you'll notice that each of these words has a slightly different meaning. And you could get more specific, like talking about what that means, like do I feel amazing because of the sunset or is the sunset just amazing to look at? Okay. So if I'm talking about uh, just understanding something like this. This is again connecting with the situation and the vocabulary. Is everybody getting this? So a native speaker, like a native child, will know the situation. They say, wow, look at that, a beautiful sunset. And people have seen uh, many sunsets over their lifetime. So they have heard many people talking about these things in different ways. All right. I think people are getting it though. We're still getting lots of good examples. But the point is, this is the law of substitution. It reminds you that there's not only one way to say something, all right? Remember, when you translate things, you're, you're kind of teaching yourself that there's one way to say something, but there isn't usually one way to say something. There is, I, I, I'll, I'll just say there's always a different way of expressing something. You might use different words, but that's the basic idea. All right, so you might not have like, there might be only one word for saying something, but we can always maybe use some different words or describe things in, you know, like with a, some other way. All right, typically just different vocabulary, but there are multiple ways to say anything. And so we train ourselves to do this when we remind ourselves, oh, natives are expressing things in different ways. All right, this is the law of substitution. So if you're, if you're just thinking about a translation, like you learn, uh, you know, some, you're an alien and you come to the United States and you're trying to learn some English that way, you begin with a word in your native language. No, 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 no. You begin with English and you look at the situation. 
We have all these people looking at a beautiful sunset and they're all describing the same thing in different ways. All right, it's the same situation, the same context, but they will describe it differently. And that's because there are different words. There are always different words for doing that. And as we hear these words, we can make further connections with these words to other things, all right? So I could have like an amazing dinner or a wonderful dinner, but I wouldn't talk about the dinner being captivating because it, the, the dinner doesn't like, it's not holding my attention. It's a slightly different word. So I wouldn't use it in that situation. And as we get these examples, we'll talk about that in a further law here. But as we get these different examples, it's that that really helps us understand the vocabulary well, so we use it fluently. Okay? I keep repeating over and over and over again because we get new people coming to watch the videos, but also because everyone should be reminded of this, that you really become fluent as you understand the language well. All right, marvelous. Another good example. All right, everybody's getting it though. If you have any questions about this idea of substitution, let me know. Remember, you are already doing this in your native language already. You probably can think of multiple ways to describe almost anything, and I just want you to do it in English, okay? So we begin by making associations. These substitutions, these are associations as well, okay? It's all, everything I'm going to share with you today is all about making associations but I'm trying to make it more clear kind of how the brain is working and thinking about things in different ways, okay? But really, it's just about making connections within the language itself. So the more connections you make in English, the easier it is to speak. All right, checking comments, make sure everybody's doing all right. Everybody's getting it. Let's see, if you know other people who would also like to think more in English, share the video. Uh, all right. All right, Bruno says, I used to create daily situations in my brain. I would start to speak to myself so I could feel that I was talking in the correct form, what I've heard from native speakers before not. Yep, yeah, that's a good way to do it. C says, uh, should we put a reason case behind adjective we want to remember? Should we put a reason case behind it? Well, you should, put, you should make the vocabulary more memorable in general. It doesn't matter if it's an adjective or, or whatever. So like the examples I give here, I don't just give a list of things. I'm, I'm actually trying to give a smaller number of things and then help you understand those by making associations. All right, so part of that could be just associating with the word itself, or I'm also making associations with other words, all in English. So everything I'm going to share in this video, all these laws are helpful for remembering vocabulary. It could be adjectives or verbs or whatever. Uh, Amon says, what's the difference between exasperated and angry? So exasperated, if I'm angry, I'm just like, yeah, I'm, like I'm pretty angry, but exasperated is a whole other level. So it's a much higher, super frustrated, super angry, just like, ah, all right, I'm done, I'm finished. I'm finished with this video. That's when you are exasperated. All right, some good examples over here. All right. Oh my goodness, got, got, a, bunch of, got a bunch of comments here. All right, here, let me see here. Lucas goes blank. Oh, I think you're talking about your mind. He has a great way to learn English. He's associating with other English words you already know. Yes, all right. Jack says, sorry, teacher, means of association. So you just go back and watch the video again where we talk about that. But the core thing is if you have a word and you don't know what it means at all, try really understanding the situation you find it in. And you can do that by getting more examples of the word or seeing it just in different, different situations where people are, like I'm exasperated at the motor vehicle place because I want to get a new driver's license and it's really frustrating. Or I'm at home trying to take care of a bunch of kids and uh, ah, like there are too many things going on, I'm getting frustrated, I can't handle that, and so I get exasperated. Okay, so the more examples you get, that's how you do it. All right, hi teacher, I have a question. I'm asking you, lend or borrow, does it mean the same thing? No, uh, like lend is like you're giving something and borrow is something you're getting, okay? So if I go to the library, the library is lending me the book, but I am borrowing the book from the library. So it just depends on uh, where you're, what, like, who, who the perspective is, all right? So if I borrow a book or I'm getting something like I'm getting that thing, I'm borrowing that thing, but the book is being lent, so the library is lending me something like that. 
you can just remember it like lending library. That's typically we talk about something like that, a lending library. Uh, Delado says, hi, teacher. Do you know I lived in Salt Lake City? Today I live in Utah. I like your class. Glad to hear. Sean says, when you learn a new language, you still need some common words. Okay, I get it. I can recite. You need some common words. Well, the, the point is that it doesn't matter what the words are. You should be learning all that in English. All right? So... It's not like you begin by learning some things in your native language and then stop translating. No, no, you, from the very beginning. So what I'm doing in my videos is trying to help people who, who did not learn the language this way. So they spent many years learning English as a second language, and now I'm trying to get them to, to like retrain their brain so they can think and speak in English. All right. <coughs> All right, uh, I think more effective, better than learn longer, which I mean kind is you feel more excited and relaxed and take a break for learning 30 minutes, you do a little stretch. <laughs> All right, let's see. Hello, Drew. Greetings, everyone. What about kind, amazing, wonderful, gorgeous, mesmerizing? Okay, lots of good examples over here. Neil says, why do we say that women are beautiful and men are handsome? Uh, I don't know the etymology of that, like the, the history of that, but uh, like... Typically, we just have different words for describing things because it's slightly different. Like a handsome, like handsome is, that's an interesting question, actually. Uh, but like the, the typical like male, like male beauty, I guess you could call it, is like, it's like of a different kind than female beauty. And I think like sex is part of that. Uh, let's see. But it'd be interesting to learn more about that. Uh, let's see, and Lucas says, what are your must-have smartphone apps? Uh, like for learning languages? I don't use any language learning smartphone apps. Stunning, mind-blowing, second to none. Easy, it's the easy on the eyes, easy on the eyes. But easy on the eyes is, it's like, again, the, like a lot of the examples you've, get, you've given are good, but they are, you notice how they are slightly different. And as you get more examples of these things, it makes the network that much better. So you really understand things and you understand a subtle difference between pretty and beautiful. So if you look at like, oh, that's a pretty actress. She's like, you know, like an eight out of 10, but a beautiful woman is like, you know, I don't know, like nine or 10 out of 10, something like that. So people will typically rank that higher and a woman, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a woman, but I could, you know, <clears throat> if a man, if like, if a bunch of men called me pretty, but I had a friend and, and those men were saying she was beautiful, I would feel a little bit sad. <laughs> I would think, oh, okay, like, my, like I'm kind of at like a lower, you know, a lower rank. <laughs> It doesn't mean I'm a worse person. I'm just, you know, like phys physically attractiveness, you know, just thinking about that. <clears throat> Lucas says, is there a quote or saying that you live uh, your life by? I don't know. I guess my quote for you would be learn English as a first language. <laughs> That's your quote. You need to live life by that. I don't really have a particular quote, I think, for my life generally. Uh, I don't know. I should think about that. But uh, how to apply this kind of laws. All right. Remember, Mohammed, your brain is doing these things already in your native language. I'm just trying to remind you that these things are happening so that you can follow the laws in English. Follow the law. I'm, I should have like a policeman hat on <laughs> for this video. Follow the law. <clears throat> All right. Uh, hello. Good night, teacher. Uh, Brazil. Now, remember, when you're leaving a conversation, you say good night or if someone is going to bed. But if it's just evening, you would say good evening. All right, so subtle difference between night and evening with this greeting. When you see someone, hey, good evening, and now I might begin a long conversation with them. But at the end of the conversation, I would say, oh, good night. All right. <clears throat> uh, XDL, uh, let me get this. Somebody said socialism better than capitalism, but you know what? And what Berlin Wall came to the other side. <laughs> XDL, you're, you are, uh, like, your brain is always on some, uh, some interesting, unrelated uh, subjects over here. Luke says, what's my level? I have no idea. Brad said, learning phrases, especially the longer ones, are a lot harder to remember. Yes, Brad. Uh, Brett, but it becomes easier uh, if you understand the pieces of those things, and uh, that's why I continue to remind everybody about that. Like, an idiom, for example, you would have different meanings. It, it, like, an idiom is tricky because of each of those words. 
uh, you understand it as kind of like a core unit by itself, uh, but the meaning changes with an idiom. But uh, the, the same law kind of applies here where if you understand the individual words, then that will help you understand the, the whole of something. Uh, and with an idiom, that becomes like its own core thing by itself. So whatever the smallest unit of meaning in a, in a particular phrase or a situation, whatever, that's the thing you need to understand from the situation. And that's why we begin with association over here. So if I have an idiom, I might know the words in that idiom like kick the bucket. So kick the bucket. I know those words. But the idiom, like what does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. It just means to die. But if we have a story about that, we can understand something like that. There are examples. There's, there are reasons why we have these particular meanings. So the idiom is not as crazy or weird as we might think. And it's not actually difficult if we take some time to try making associations, all right? So we'll talk a little bit about that more in these future uh, further laws down here. But I want to make sure I'm getting everybody's questions. All right, uh, Papa says, please teach us all the forms of the verb get. No, I'm not covering that in this video. <laughs> uh, but I do have videos on get and Fluent for Life members uh, get lots of that as well. Hello from Colorado Springs. Let's say ages is good morning, Lucas. Uh, what do you do to improve students' speaking skills? I help them understand the language very well so they feel confident about speaking. That's my job. Okay. So when people ask, like, what do I do? What's the, what, what is the purpose of me? Like, it's not to teach the language. It's to help you understand the language really well so you feel confident. You don't have doubts about what does this word mean or how do you pronounce it or when do I use the word. As soon as you, uh, like, solve all of those, if you answer all those questions, that's when you unlock your ability to speak. So it's more about unlocking the vocabulary. That's what we do here at English Anyone. Okay. So I don't want to just give you a bunch of like here, like memorize this list of words. That's not that's not uh, teaching anything. I, like you could open up a book and just get a list of words. You get that from the dictionary. The point is, do you understand that? Do you feel confident about using it? That's the whole point. All right. Uh, let's see. MC says you are so patient and clever. Wow, and I get an, uh, an award, a gold medal for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, MC. Gl uh, great explanation, says Manuel. Ildar, Ildar says, uh, yes, handsome. My guess is, I liked your point and adapted to learning English as my first language and not doing translation in native language. It's helping. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Yes. Remember, you are doing this already in your native language. So if you think about your native language, you're already making associations when you learn new words and you're already learning substitutions. Or you have different ways of describing things. So you might be having a conversation in your language, so not English, in your language, and maybe you forget a word, I can't remember that, or I don't really know what that means. Let me use a different word instead. You're simply using the law of substitution, okay? So I'm encouraging you to learn this way, but we learn substitutions within English itself. I'm not trying to learn different substitutions in my native language and then try to translate those things. I want to understand those things uh, all in English. Uh, let's see, Pawasam. Lucas says, how do you motivate your students? Well, I make the language easy, easy to understand. That's it. The, the motivation comes when, you, when you're like, oh, wow, I got it. I understand what that means, especially if you discover that yourself. So the motivation, I, I don't need to make you motivated. I just need to make the language easy to understand. And if you understand it, then you feel confident and you are motivated to learn more. That's like why people join Fluent for Life, because they, they learn with these videos on YouTube and they want the whole system to get fluent faster. So that, that's, it's, it's like self-motivation, but I'm, I'm really just, my job is to make the language easy to understand. Uh, do you have any questions for us? Uh, no, <laughs> not at the moment. Uh, let's start, says, uh, hi, Drew, good morning from Indonesia, just joined here. Don't know what the topic is yet, so let me see what's going on. Well, just look at the title of the video. That should give you a clue. All right. A, uh, how long does it take to speak English fluently about almost everything? Well, I mean, about almost everything. I mean, even native speakers could be learning for many, many years and can't. I, there are many things I, I just don't know about, like talking about biology uh, or space travel or, I don't know, lots of industries that I don't know anything about. So I couldn't speak fluently about most of those things. But the good news is most people don't need to speak fluently about everything. There's like 2% of the language, 2% that people actually use for most communication. 
uh, and that's really what you need to know. And it doesn't take that long to learn that stuff, especially if you learn it as a first language. All right, should I write down some case to know when to use a precise personality? For instance, Mr. Andrew dropped his marker frequently, so he's clumsy. Yeah, you can think of a story like that. That's a good way to make another association. All right, so it's a good, good, way to, good way to think about that. All right, it says the YouTube content for natives, slightly complicated, but good for sharpening listening skills on a daily basis. Yes, and that's another reason why it's good to have a teacher because if you jump from English learning content to native content, there will be a lot of things that you don't understand. So if you have, uh, if you have a good understanding, then you're okay to follow that content. But if not, it's good to have some help. All right, uh, Sean says, uh, why I can understand what you say, but I can't understand other people. So this is a common question, and it just... The answer is very simple. It's you are listening to a different kind of English right now than what natives speak. So I'm speaking more slowly, more clearly, and I'm using uh, just easier vocabulary that I think you would know. So I'm not using movie references or cultural references or difficult idioms or phrasal verbs or other things that I think you might not know. All right. So I make the language easier to understand. So what we do in Fluent for Life is we get you from this level, so understanding me, to understanding natives. But you have to do that in the right steps to really make it uh, easy for you to understand natives. All right, uh, Sagwin says, could you tell me about dangling, a dangling sentence? No, this is not the time for that. <clears throat> anything like that, like information, you can just Google that. You don't really need me to explain anything like that for you. Muhammad says, when we listen to, when we listen a lot, we acquire this law. Well, you, you're you applying the law when you when you think about it. I'm, I'm trying to get you to know what the laws are so you apply them consciously. So you think, hey, Here's a new word in English, but I don't quite understand it. Maybe I should try to make some more associations or get some more examples of that word. So youglish.com is a good way to get examples of things uh, or just searching on YouTube. So if I want to know what a party is, like the word party, I should look up different examples of that. And so it could be like a party of people. It just means a group. So I go to a restaurant and people say, how many in your party? All right, how many in your party? And I say, oh, there are six of us, all right? So in that case, like a party, it doesn't mean like, yay, like having fun, like a birthday party. It just means a group of people, all right? But we could have a birthday party or a pool party or something like that. It just means a group of people. So a party of people could be together on an adventure. And the more examples of that we get, so if, I getting, if I'm getting, as a native speaker, more examples of party, then that will help me understand the word. All right. And so this is how we make associations within the English language itself to understand the word better. I think people uh, get the idea, though. All right. Uh, Alexanderson says, is it OK to use advanced vocabulary if the person will maybe not understand what I say? Well, that's that's up to you. I, I, I try to the reason I'm speaking using the vocabulary I use now is because I want people to understand me. But if you don't care about people understanding you, then say whatever you like. <laughs> it just, you know, it depends on what, what the goal of the conversation is. All right. Uh, let's see. What's the opinion about Biden required Taylor Swift to stand with him? Kind of interesting. Well, I, I guess Taylor, people know Taylor Swift, and I guess Democrats and Republicans would both like to stand next to Taylor Swift, I, I guess. I don't know. Uh, how long are you fluently in Japanese as song? Well, I, again, when I become fluent, my, my, lang my personal language learning journey for learning Japanese, I came to Japan in 2003, and I started learning uh, Japanese as a second language. So what I'm telling you not to do, I did that thing. So the typical thing, instead of learning English as a second language, I was learning Japanese as a second language. And that means I'm trying to study vocabulary. I think about things in English and translate them into my head, but I could never speak fluently. And I did that for about a year. And after that, I discovered, oh, I should actually be learning Japanese the same way Japanese people do. And that means learning Japanese as a first language rather than learning it as a second language. And once I did that, I also discovered you become fluent in individual words and phrases as you understand them. So uh, the, the process of becoming fluent was actually very quick and you and it could be like you know a minute or less to understand even one word and feel confident about using it. And then it just takes longer depending on 
on how many words or whatever you want to learn. Uh, but the process is much faster when you learn a language as a first language rather than as a second, especially if you have someone to help you learn. All right. So with me, it was a bit more difficult because I'm basically like teaching myself Japanese and I continue to do that. I don't have a like a Japanese teacher right now. Even my wife is like too, my wife gets exasperated if I if I ask her like, hey, what, what about this like Japanese or whatever? I'm asking her questions. She's like, I don't know. Like, you know, like hey, you're supposed to be my wife. Help me learn something, you know. Uh, XD again, uh, he's 82 or 81, I'm not sure, but he, uh, he does it again, I'm moving, 85, yeah, I, like, I don't know, God help us if he wins, you know, <laughs> like, he'd be, he's all, there's so many videos of Joe Biden, just like, hey, just, what's going on here, you know, <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right. Uh, happy Jesus. Drew, can you please recommend an English word book for me? How many words are there in English? I always feel like I can't learn. No, no, don't worry about a book. Don't get a book. Watch my videos and this will, this will get you understanding what you should do. Don't buy another book about vocabulary. The point is to understand the language like a native. So begin with like the video like you're watching here on YouTube. Think about a topic you're interested in and get lots of examples of that. You can see an example I have on YouTube called uh, how to make espresso in English. Watch that video. Just search my channel for that. Uh, let's see. All right, I think. All right, uh, how to improve pronouncing a difficult or new word. It just, you, Makesh, you just need to get different examples of people saying this. That's it. So if you hear a word, just get more examples of that thing. That's how you do it. So find other people saying that thing. Uh, it could be videos or podcasts or whatever. Uh, Brett, again, do you happen to know when we speak or think we tend to visualize the words by themselves or just visualize the situation or idea? It just, it's like you can think about it like a, like a unit. I know you, you might want to overthink this and think like, well, now we get to really analyze the language and how we're speaking about it. It's just, do I understand what I'm saying or not? So if I'm thinking about something and I say like, wow, that woman is, that woman is ugly. All right. Now I mean beautiful, but I say ugly, like because I, I just got the words confused in my mind, and everyone looks at me like, oh, I can't believe he just said that woman is ugly. Like, and I was, and I'm thinking, why is everybody looking at me? I thought I'd said she, and I, ah, I, I said the wrong word. And so there, that's like, it's just, an, I'm not trying to visualize what it means. I just understand. Ah, I, I, I didn't understand the word. I used it incorrectly, or I used one word where I meant to use another one. Okay. So in that situation, like, I'm not trying to visualize what like ugly or beautiful means. It's actually the opposite. Like the situation is giving me the visual and here's the, the way I would describe that thing. But I just used the wrong word. So, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say beautiful, you know. So like I've done that like in Japanese where I say one thing and I meant to say something else just because I used the wrong word. Uh, and so I'm, it, but it's, I'm not like thinking about it like consciously, it just... Either I forgot the word or I didn't understand it well enough to use it correctly. All right, so get more examples of things. That's really what's going to help you understand things, especially if you're making uh, like basic errors. You really want to get lots of examples so you feel confident about what you want to say. All right, how to learn vocabulary probably using images according to you. I thought it would be a trigger my brain when speaking. Uh, it really, it doesn't matter how you learn the vocabulary. It's just do you understand the vocabulary or not? So you notice when I'm making associations with the word, it could be a visual association. It could be like a mental association. It could be just like how I feel. So if I'm watching a scary movie and someone says, wow, that was a frightening scene, then I, I, I can understand from the context like, oh, like frightening, that must mean like scary, all right? Or like really scary. And so I'm, I'm not like, I'm not trying to overthink this. It's just like, do I understand what people are saying? And do I feel confident about using that vocabulary as well? If I don't feel confident, it means I have a question or a doubt about that vocabulary that I need to answer. Okay, so solve that, erase that doubt, and that will help you use that thing fluently. That's how it works. Uh, let's see, because we want to talk, we can't talk any politics in... Uh, in Canada or see, uh, China, I guess. So if you are interested in history or politics, it'll be a little sad for you. Seriously, if you criticize the bad action of the government, you might be in trouble. Yes, 
Uh, increasingly, that's happening more in Western countries as well. Uh, Makesh says, your point is absolutely right, but practicing doesn't help real-time speaking. Sure it does. Uh, again, like the point, when I talk about practicing vocabulary, I mean getting varied examples of that thing until I really understand it. That's how I speak. So the reason I can speak Japanese fluently, even though I don't know the whole language, and I, I don't know the whole English language either, but the words I do know, I can speak mostly like using them fluently. Um, but the reason I can do that is because I've had lots of examples and I feel confident that I understand something. If I don't understand something, then I just you know, either ask people questions about it or, or do something that's going to help me understand the vocabulary. Uh, let's see. Uh, MZ says, do you still help your wife uh, with, you could say, help your wife with her English? Do you still help your wife with your English? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and I'm teaching her and uh, obviously I'm teaching my kids all the time. And so I'm like giving, I'm giving them lessons they don't realize they're learning, but they're learning lots of things. And uh, my wife as well, so I'll be I'll be kind of teaching her, and often I share many of those lessons like with with learners or in these videos. All right, uh, all right, that's enough about Biden. <laughs> all right, uh, Alex Anderson, is it uh, thinking in to start interpreting the world in a different way? I mean, in terms of time and space, for example, using verbal tenses which don't exist in your native language. Well, that that it could be part of it. But like, I'm not asking you to like change your life, you know. <laughs> this is just, again, you are doing these things already, all right? I gave the example before about learning the word tsunami, all right? So an English child learns the word tsunami and they don't know that that's from Japanese. Or they don't, I mean, they don't even know about the history of many words that are from French or German or Italian or Spanish or Latin or whatever. They just understand it like it's in English. So the point is they're learning it as a first language rather than learning it as a translation or thinking like, oh, that's a Japanese word that I'm learning. They don't think about that at all. And so when you think about how do I express something with a different verb tense or something, uh, all of it could be different from your native language, but this isn't like a... Uh, it's not like a life-changing thing. I mean, actually, it could change your life if you do it properly, but I'm not asking you to change your life in order to do this. You're doing these things already as you learn, but your brain will think about English like it's your first language if you learn this way. Okay, so don't overcomplicate it, but the point is that you should really be understanding things uh, the same way that you do in your native language. All right, Daniel says, I've just got your teacher. In your opinion, which is better to improve my journey on learning English, reading or listening, because that's what I do the most? Uh, I would say both of those are helpful, but it doesn't matter if you don't really understand the content. That's the most important thing. You should understand something well enough to feel confident about speaking. All right. Uh, I don't mean just understand something like you recognize it. You should understand it well enough to feel confident using it in your regular conversations or everyday life or writing. How often do you broadcast live? Uh, typically once a week, I guess. All right, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, you could say, it's so interesting to hear you live. All right, I decided not to sleep tonight. It's so interesting. And so and such, you should review that uh, in the lessons. Uh, but yeah, this is a common thing like, it's so nice of you, it's so interesting, but it's, it's such an interesting thing. So you could say, and this is why people get confused, so this is an understandable mistake that people have, but like, it's so interesting to do something, all right? But it's such an interesting thing. That's how we would hear it. But yes, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Well, let's go to someone. Yes, says Tucky, and a little heart. Thank you very much. Danielle, and another question, please. I'm moving to Chicago in June. What can I do there to finally achieve my C1 level? Uh, spend time around natives and listen to them in different situations. Uh, an example, go to the Lincoln Park Zoo and just stand at, like, stand at the monkey cage or whatever and listen to kids talking about the monkeys. <laughs> I know this seems like a silly example, but this is a, just one way where we're trying to get associations 
as well as substitutions when we're listening to different people describing something. So everybody's looking at the monkey cage and you know little kids are talking about things or parents are trying to teach things to their kids. So that's like a, a really good place. Like I, I enjoy going to the zoo here in Japan for the same reason or the aquarium or anything where parents are also teaching things to their own kids. So kids are speaking and uh, parents are like, oh, look at that fish over there. And so I'm listening to that like, oh, I'm, I'm just standing there like I'm pretending I'm watching the fish, but I'm, I'm there to listen to people speak, all right? So you can apply the same thing. Like if I sit at a cafe and I listen to how people order, how people give, uh, like how they take orders, different things like that. So the point is, again, we want to make associations and apply the law of substitution as well so that we can learn how different people express the same situation in different ways. All right, and the more examples we get, the more confident we feel about the language. Uh, let's see. Where I can have someone to talk with me. You don't need anybody to talk with you. You just need to get more examples. Uh, do you like uh, burning the midnight oil? Uh, no, I go to bed early. I like to, I like to be in bed by like 9.30 if I can. How many languages do you know and how long did it take you? All right, I explained that earlier, uh, but I speak uh, Japanese and English. All right. I don't know some of those, some of those kanji, but that's good. XDL, you know Japanese as well? I guess maybe if you know the, uh, know the, the, the Japanese, then you probably know the kanji as well. Mel says the bad part is when someone asks you to translate a word you only learned in English. Yes, but that's like an interesting thing. Like if you if you only know it, so the same thing happens to me. Uh, like when I'm gardening out here, and someone will ask me what the name of a flower is or something, and I, I don't know what that is in English. I only know it in Japanese. All right, Danielson, isn't it kind of uh, intersemiotic translation sometimes when you try to explain a word? Well, I mean, it's not about getting a definition or something. You're, but the, the point is I want to make associations within the language, okay? That's, that's the important thing, rather than trying to make an association between two different languages. So I want to, I want to make my, my vocabulary in the target language stronger by making connections within that language. I'm making it more difficult for myself if I try to make connections across two different languages. There's no reason to do that, all right? The whole point is to learn everything within English and make those different connections there. So yes, you, you are making an association still, but it's just a weaker one that's going to make it more difficult and cause you to translate when you speak. Uh, let's see, Alexander says, what do you think about those academies that offer learning English without any grammar? Uh, I don't know what that means. You can't, you can't really learn a language without understanding, um, like the grammar rules would be naturally found within the, within the vocabulary you're learning. Now they might be like phrasing that a certain way where we're not gonna study grammar rules but we'll help you understand the grammar automatically, which is what I do. So I'm not trying to like, teach you rules or like, I don't, that's why I don't talk about the names of grammar points or like this is the past present or the participle or other things like that because it's not helpful. It, it'd actually be more confusing uh, for people. If a native doesn't know that vocabulary, then you don't need to know that vocabulary either. It's only really useful for looking up examples of things. So it's like if I need to like, okay, what's like the past perfect of something? and I need to get examples of that and I can look up in Google like what is the past perfect. Um, so that, I mean, that's the, the, the way you would, you would get examples of that thing, but. <clears throat> All right. Aristocats says, cool thing about hearing a lot of examples of the same word, but I have a problem with conversation service such as a chat roulette. Because in every conversation, how are you and where are you from, that's all. Well, you can, you can definitely learn various ways of expressing those things. If you spend more time around natives, there are lots of ways we can greet each other. All right. I used to uh, what kids show to learn English. You mean you used to watch? Is that what you mean? Yes, I still watch Japanese children's TV shows. All right, hopefully everybody, I think everybody's getting it. All right, you are the first of what I can understand in English language like father. 
All right, well, I, I am your father. Is that what you mean? Like, you mean you can understand me? Like, well, that, that should be the point. I'm trying to make the language understandable. Thank you so much for the live corrections. I'm far from my goal. No, you are close because, and this is a thing naturally that people do, we will, we will remember the one bad thing that we did and not the 99% good that we did. So everything else was great about your sentences. And those are just simple things that you just need more examples of to really feel confident about using those things. All right, Sufain, I already answered that question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I've learned Japanese for two semesters. All right, uh, let's see. What do I think about shadowing? <clears throat> I think it's less important than just understanding the language like a native. But let's move on, because we've already been, oh my goodness, 70 minutes. You guys are gonna keep me here all day. I will be burning the midnight oil if I stay here all day. All right, next. All right, the law of extension. Uh, and so this is where we wanted to take things and start like broadening our understanding. Let me see if I had some specific laws about this or uh, specific examples. Now I've covered this often. You'll see me talking about this thing uh, in, in English, but this is where we take vocabulary. You'll notice each of these things is connected. You will see four and five, they are connected as well, but I'm, I'm teaching them in this order because I really want you to, to to really make the connections very strong within the language itself, and it's easier to do that by thinking about it this way. So we begin by making associations within the language. Ah, now I'm exasperated with these fire trucks over here, but I feel worse for the people who are, you know, calling the fire truck, I suppose. I should be, I should be grateful, actually, that I'm still having uh, good health over here and I'm still alive. Anyway, so we begin with associations. We want to move into substitutions that starts uh, broadening our vocabulary. Uh, but now we want to extend our understanding of vocabulary by thinking, how else might we use this word that we're using? As an example, uh, I could, I've covered many things like this, but I'm just explaining to you what I'm doing when I'm teaching. So when I'm applying this law of extension, we want to extend something like I'm extending my arm, I'm applying something in a different situation in a new way, uh, even though it's related. And so a basic example of something like this is we have a physical understanding of vocabulary, and then we apply that to a more uh, figurative uses. So as an example, <clears throat> the word navigate. So navigate, you can think about, let's begin with making an association. So if you don't know what the word means, you can imagine I'm on a, like, uh, a boat over here, and I have my the steering wheel, uh, and I'm, I've got my like, pirate, there's a pirate hat right there. Here's my hook, uh, and I have a sword. So I'm a, a pirate on this ship over here, and I'm looking at the stars up here. So I'm finding my way, I am navigating to figure out where I'm going. So I'm navigating something, I'm navigating. So I'm trying to figure out, like, do I want to go this way or that way or whatever. This is to navigate something, to, to figure out where I'm going, all right? So the figurative use of that, we might think like, well, I can physically navigate something. Like if I'm walking uh, on a, a sidewalk and there are many people here, I need to move around those people. I need to navigate my way uh, through this sidewalk, or I need to navigate my way through a park, like, you know, here's I'm looking at the park from the top, and I need to get from here to here to here, like a map, and so I need to navigate that thing, okay? Or I'm using a map for navigation, navigation. All right, so the point is to make, again, we begin by making associations. We're not really going to talk about substitutions because I've covered that already, but again, we want to extend this idea to how can we apply this to other situations. So I might navigate, like I've just given the example about something physical, like I'm navigating with a boat or navigating with a map, but I could also navigate my life, okay? So how do I navigate challenges? How do I figure out how to deal with something to get around something or get through a challenge? All of these things we describe as navigating that thing. And so as you learn more examples, and this is why it's so important to get examples, you will get a variety of examples of things that are like physical usage or figurative or maybe related to something else. 
Okay, hopefully everybody is getting the idea. I wanted to use maybe a slightly more challenging word that some people might not know, navigate. Okay, so a car might have a navigation system. All right, so how do we figure out where to go? That's like a physical usage of the word navigate. But again, I might navigate my life or how do I navigate uh, my career? All right, how, how do I navigate the challenges that I have in my life? So how do I get through those things? How do I understand that? And this is what natives are doing. They are extending, they are naturally extending the vocabulary. They are thinking, how can I apply something in various ways? We want to get more use out of the vocabulary. All right, another example, another way we could extend something, where we take something from one situation and apply it to another one. All right, uh, so let's say like a baseball situation. So I'm playing the game of baseball. Uh, I am the batter and the pitcher throws me the ball and I hit the ball out of the park. I hit the ball out of the park. That's called a home run in baseball and I get one score, like one point for that. And if there are other people on base, I could also get uh, points for those people as well. And so uh, if we think about that, like I hit a home run, that means to do a really good job. It's like a, a great thing you can do in that sport. We can take that and apply that to other situations. I did very well at my job presentation. So I had to give a presentation to my bosses and they said, wow, you really hit it out of the park or you really hit a home run with that one. I'm extending the vocabulary from the original place where it was to some different situation. So it began in sports and now it's being used in business. I'm extending the vocabulary. So people are always thinking like, how can I take this and apply it in someplace else? Uh, and your brain is doing this naturally. So it's, it's helpful if you're actually like kind of using your brain and encouraging your words uh, to, do, to do these things, okay? So if I'm, I'm, I'm showing you these laws, I'm, I'm just reminding you that you have them so that you remember, oh, I wonder how else or where else, what other situations or other contexts might I use this word, okay? So it could be the same thing. So I, like navigate is a word or hit the ball out of the park. That's a, like a, a phrase or just like, a, like you hit the ball out of the park. So you could say that whole thing, but in lots of different situations. So anytime someone does an amazing thing, they give a great speech, they deliver a great presentation, they, I don't know, anything else that someone could do very well, wow, you, you hit a home run. Or you hit a, like, even if I find, like, let's say I, I bring my girlfriend home to my family to meet my family the first time, uh, and my dad is talking with me in the kitchen, he's like, wow, you really hit a home run with that girl. You know, like, so you really like you found like a, you know, that's like a nice, I mean, she seems like a nice girlfriend or whatever. Okay, so you can see how something might be applied in various ways. This is the law of extension. So your brain is automatically doing this. I'm just reminding you to think consciously about these things. How can I make more associations? How can I substitute this for something else? How can I extend this to other things? All right. Let me check comments before we move on to the next one. I think people are getting it though. Chat is a little bit more quiet right now, but that's good. All right, uh, let's see. I mean, every conversation in those services chat roulette is not going further than how are you, where are you from, and it's hard to hear. Well, you should get out of that situation. Get off chat roulette and talk, talk with people elsewhere. <laughs> Find some actual people that are interested in the things you're interested in and talk with them. That's how you do it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Zhao says, uh, my man. Hi, man from English. Anyone? There you go. I just discovered you recently. I was looking for an English interview because I was looking to be interviewed for a job in the U.S. and I wanted to see what English interviews are like. Yep. Yeah, just watch natives interviewing people. And about interviewing for, for jobs, uh, I, would, I would encourage you, this is not about the English language, but in general, find information about the company, find out what their problems are, and explain how you can help solve those problems. All right, that's a much better way to get a job than to just, you know, like, I could, I could have bad English and still get a job um, if I'm able to solve the problem that a company has. So that's making yourself more valuable and more likely to get hired. All right, Sean says, because I can't understand other only speak English, uh, only if I listen to what you're talking about, I like to listening more. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear you're understanding this. All right, 
Uh, very good. Let's see. Navigate is the best I need. Yeah, the best way to learn English. Yeah. So you're trying to navigate your English learning journey or navigate like all the, you know, the different ways of learning English or lots of things maybe you've heard on YouTube. It's, uh, it can be frustrating. You can be exasperated or well, it can be an exasperating experience uh, trying to figure all that out. Uh, yes, Midnight Oil is also an Australian band. Uh, it was a great experience to follow the live for the first time. I enjoyed watching it. All right. Uh, you're <laughs> navigating between your learners and your whiteboard. Yes. Excellent usage, MC. Very good. So that means you got it. So you should feel that in your brain like, wow, like, yeah, I got it. You know, you, maybe you knew the word already, but very good. Excellent usage. Uh, Sean says, new words from this lesson is very soon. Or you mean like uh, many, 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 many words or they are, they are coming quickly? XD again, fun fact, every time I speak to someone, they be like, bro, you from L.A.? Because I've watched a lot of movies like Rush Hour and Jackie Chan. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> yes, Chris Tucker talking in that movie. That's a funny movie. All those are. I like when he goes into, a, he's in a, like a museum or something, and he sees a Buddha statue, and he's like, he's like man, that, that Buddha would look good in my bathroom. <laughs> That Buddha would look good in my bathroom. All right, my guess is you are an amazing teacher. You would say you are an amazing teacher. Or you would just say you are amazing, I guess. But if you want to say teacher specifically, you would say you are an amazing teacher. Japanese child show, you make my day. <laughs> All right, well, an amazing teacher. Yes, you would say an, a nice, amazing teacher. I navigate a gay become a dolphin lover. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, moving on, moving on. As I get rid of this uh, pirate over here, we'll navigate our way through the video. I didn't think I would be talking this long uh, today. <laughs> but anyway, it's okay. All right, the law of deconstruction. D, construction. So now we're trying to get even at pieces of words and really understand what they mean as we get more examples of things. So remember, sometimes we will hear a word. Monocle. 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 Let's say you hear a new word, but you don't know what it means. Now, don't be frustrated by that. Hopefully, you can make some association. I'm going to teach this in a slightly tricky way, just for example. Uh, but if we hear other examples, huh, that's interesting. Like both of these have this word mono in there. And a monorail, maybe we know what a monorail is. A monorail is uh, instead of having two tracks or a regular train line, a monorail has just one. So the train is riding on a single rail like that, mono. All right, let's say I'm a mono, I'm monolingual, monolingual. What do you think that means if I'm monolingual? Monolingual, monolingual, monolingual. Does anyone know what that means? Anyone heard that word before, monolingual? You might be able to guess what it means. I'll let you post that in the chat. So if we know, that's interesting, a monorail means one rail. So what might monolingual mean? Monolingual. Monolingual. This means one language. Yeah, you can speak just one language. So uh, if we go back and look at this, as we, we might learn a word like this, people might not know what this is. This is monocle, monocle. A monocle is one eyeglass, one eyeglass. So maybe you've seen like the Monopoly man, like he has a, he's got two eyes like this and a little, like a mustache and he's just got a, like a monocle hanging down like that, a little top hat. So the monocle. So you, kinda, you hold it in place by squeezing your eye like that, a monocle. Yes, monolith is another example. So monolith is one stone, a large, tall stone, or it could be a long stone as well, but a monolith. And so again, if we take the law of extension before that, 
We've got monolithic, which is something that's like very big. Oh my goodness, this is like a monolithic problem. All right, so if a monolith is like one big stone like this, we are deconstructing the language by understanding things as we get more examples of them. So now we learn a new word like monocle. So a monocle is just that one eyepiece instead of glasses where we have two, all right? And so we can also make further connections if monolingual means I speak one language, then something like bilingual. It should be easier to understand, oh, I bet monolingual means one language. So we know this means language. Bi means two. Okay. So monolingual, bilingual, trilingual trilingual. All right. So as we get examples, this is a, it's another way of making associations, but we're kind of deconstructing words and understanding them within the language itself. So I'm not trying to translate from another language. I'm understanding everything within English. And I, I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want you to be uh, conscious that you're doing these things. Yes, prefixes, suffixes, root words, things like that. So the same thing, it, even within a word like uh, we'll have maybe prefixes or suffixes, or you could have a situation like a phrase with a couple of words and you understood the whole phrase, but you didn't understand what, like, what maybe one word meant. But as you get more examples, as you, as you continue to expand your vocabulary and make more connections, then you will understand more words better and you can begin producing new words and even making up new words yourself. Okay. Everybody getting it? Let me check comments here. This should be pretty easy to understand. This is something that naturally happens as you learn, but I'm encouraging you to think consciously about it so that you make more connections. All right. So you start looking for things like this, like, oh, that's interesting. Look at that. Like the same part and that had the same meaning. I bet that also means the same thing in other situations. So we're deconstructing words, we're deconstructing phrases to understand what individual words might mean, and then we're using that to make our own vocabulary stronger. So all of this is about answering questions, removing doubt, learning more so that we feel more confident, and that's when we speak fluently. This is following the laws. Follow the law. I'm like Judge Dredd. I am the law. Okay, I'm telling you. Follow the laws and you will think more in English. Don't follow the laws and fail to follow the laws and you will struggle and you will be thinking more in your native language. All right. I think I just saw someone mention water as a good idea. Ah. All right. I'll check comments uh, before we go on to the next, the last law. But I think everybody, let's see. Uh, Dran says fascistas. Nice to see Dran over there. It's been a while. Uh, no, I know what burning. No, I know what burning mine. Uh, man that can speak one language. Yeah, so it just means uh, like anyone who can speak one language. So monolingual. You could be multi or multilingual. That would mean many languages. All right. But as you get more examples, now you start feeling, ah, like I'm, I'm getting it. I understand what these things mean. And you're thinking about it. You're understanding it like a native. That's the point. When you understand something like a native, you can use the language fluently. All right, Sita. Well, nice to see you there. The manager. All right. I'm late, but I'll watch on the replay. And now any new words from chat? Uh, now any new words from chat, not from teaching? Monopoly monograph. Yeah. So lots of examples. Uh, let's see. So we have monocycle, another term for unicycle. Yeah, people typically say unicycle, but like it'd be the same kind of idea. Uh, let's see. How to link deconstructing with association. So again, Mama, these are like I'm making, you're, you're connecting words together. That is, it's just a different kind of association. So that's why I said really like language learning is really all about association. The question is, are you making associations within English or are you using your native language and making associations there? So you get fluent when you make more associations in English itself. 
rather than trying to make associations across two different languages. Okay, so if I'm deconstructing things, I'm still learning how, how these associations work by learning what the pieces of words mean. Okay, so we go to learning words, and as we get more examples, we might think, oh, these are good substitutions, or this is an extension, this is another situation or another context when I might use a word, or we might be able to deconstruct the words and really understand what they mean by themselves, and we're able to do that as we get more examples. So one word isn't really going to teach us much, but if we have a few related words, that's where we really start making these natural associations. Remember, your brain is doing these things already, but I'm encouraging you to make, a, make it more active, more conscious. Like, hey, how can I make more associations with the vocabulary I'm learning? How could I substitute this vocabulary with something else? How could I extend my vocabulary to use it in a different situation? How can I deconstruct that? Maybe I can take this vocabulary and uh, use it elsewhere, or I could uh, even break the pieces of it and see how those are connected with other words. So all of this, these are all associations, they're all connections, it's just here are specific ways of thinking about that. I think everybody has got it though. Uh, ah, monogamous, yeah, it means having uh, well, um, like a mono monogamous person is, is uh, like having one partner. So a polygamous person would be many, like poly, meaning many. <clears throat> polygamous. When I hear the sentence, follow you, Lord, I think of Kanye. Good. <laughs> One explosion, two W, three ownership. Ah, are you, you're talking about like the levels of understanding that I talked about before. Uh, I'll mention that very briefly before we move on to number five. So I'm, I'm really just giving names to things that people do already. So people are, are you're naturally doing all these things in your, in your native language, and typically like more successful people are actively applying these things even in their native language. So that's how they have more interesting writing or more interesting conversations or speeches or whatever. They're just actively applying these different things. So when I talk about different levels of understanding, uh, you could be exposed. So to be exposed to the language, you're just hearing it somewhere, or you're reading it, or you're getting it, but maybe you don't really understand what it means. So this is the lowest level. Then we move up to awareness. This is where you understand something and you can recognize it when people are talking to you. Oh, I understand what something means. Uh, but when we go to ownership, pardon this fat marker, Ownership means you understand it well enough to feel confident using that vocabulary. All right, but this is how you can think about it. So any, any vocabulary will go through these three phases, but people typically get stuck here at awareness. So they think they know something, but they don't really. And they say, why can I understand a lot of people, but I can't speak? I say, well, it's because you are able to recognize vocabulary, but you don't know it as well as you think you do. So you don't have ownership of the vocabulary. So as soon as you try to speak, you'll think, oh, wait, am I pronouncing it correctly? Is this grammatically correct? Is this the right word? Uh, if you have any doubts about the vocabulary, you don't have ownership of the vocabulary. Uh, let's see, guide to English is let's grow together. Ahmed says, only listening podcasts and improve my language, specifically my speaking. Well, I don't know why you would only listen to podcasts. It's much better to watch video because you can see physical examples of people doing stuff. It's the same way children learn, all right? Yes, monofilament, same idea. All right, uh, last one. The law of inquiry, law of inquiry. And this means we're going to take what we know and we're gonna to try to extend even further. We might ask like, what's the opposite of a word or uh, what might be like a more casual or more professional way of saying something? Uh, what might be the history of this word? So the more I actively am asking questions about that word, I'm trying to create even more or further associations with that word by thinking about the origin of the word. So that's the etymology, uh, where the word comes from, like if it's a different language or somebody created that word in English. I'm asking 
further questions. Again, the whole point of this exercise is to understand that we really become a confident speaker when we feel certain about vocabulary. Okay? So we feel, if we still have questions, this is where we apply the law of inquiry. Our, our brains are naturally doing this anyway. That's why people ask me lots of questions all the time. They're like, oh, how do I say this? Or is this the right word for that situation? That's inquiry. And so this fills in really anything you might have left if you still have questions or doubts about the vocabulary. But these are the five laws you can follow. And I guarantee if you follow these laws, you will think and speak more like a native speaker. Okay. So remember, just as a wrap up, a conclusion for this video, you have lots of examples already of things in your native language where you have different ways of saying words. So you can't say like, well, I, I have a way to say money in my native language already. Well, that's great. You probably have many ways of saying money in your native language. So that doesn't stop you from learning new ones. And the only difference, it's just psychological where you're, where you're thinking, like, oh, am I translating to learn this word or am I understanding it all in English? All right. So anything you learn as a first language, you will be able to use as a first language if you understand the vocabulary. All right. So this is why we want to make associations. We want to find substitutes for that vocabulary. And we do all of these things naturally as we're paying attention. But as an adult learning, you can actively do these things. So if I learn a word and I don't quite understand it, I should get more examples of that thing. Maybe I should also learn some different ways of talking about that same situation. So if I go to a cafe and I listen to different people ordering food, I'm getting substitutions of that particular vocabulary or different ways of describing the same situation. All right. I can also extend that by thinking, how else might I apply this situation? So if I'm calling and ordering a pizza, I might use similar vocabulary when I'm ordering, I don't know, some other thing. It could be other food or other thing off of the telephone. All right. I could also be deconstructing naturally the language when I'm looking at different ways that people are using the language, getting different words and noticing their natural connections, like we talked about with mono and bi before. So if we got monolingual, bilingual, trilingual, okay? We can talk about how many languages a person knows like a tricycle. Here's a uh, little bike for kids uh, with one, two, three wheels on it. Tricycle, tricycle, tri, okay? And if anything is still left after we've gone through all of these things, we still have just naturally. Again, you are, people are doing this already. If you look back at the chat, it's a whole bunch of people asking me questions. The law of inquiry. The brain is naturally trying to find enough information until it feels satisfied, until it feels sure and certain. This is like the most, uh, like the biggest thing that people are looking for in life in general. Certainty. We'll put that, the big C. Certainty. People want to be certain. All right. People want to know, like, it's like if you're making an investment or whatever, will I get my money back? People want to be certain. They want to eliminate risk. They want to eliminate the risk of being embarrassed in a conversation. And that's why they continue to ask questions until they have ownership of the vocabulary. Okay. All right. Let's see what time it is. It's already 1130. Look at that. A hundred minutes. Oh my goodness. But it felt good. Look at you guys. Ooh, I thought this might be a long one, but wrapping up, I'll look at last comments here, but hopefully this makes sense. Remember, you follow the laws and you will think more in English. Break the laws or just don't apply them for learning English and you will continue to struggle. All right, it's really that simple. But remember, you're already doing these things automatically in your native language. And uh, if you actually do them consciously, if you apply these things consciously, even in your native language, you will become a better speaker of your native language as well. Okay. All right. Last uh, questions over here. Uh, let's see. XD again, Mr. Drew, have you ever tried Chinese food before? Because I've seen a lot of Chinese restaurant running in Japan videos on YouTube. Yes. Uh, and again, I'm from the United States. So we got quite a few Chinese restaurants over there too. Uh, actually, I heard like a lot of Chinese food, like in Chinese restaurants, it's like, it's kind of New Year's Chinese food, not what people normally eat. I have no idea. I just heard that. But 
because I was wondering, wow, this is like, it's like really kind of fatty, rich food. And it's like people like, <laughs> I don't see a lot of like fat people in China, but I don't know, maybe for whatever reason, but they can't be eating like that every day. All right. Uh, how to get ride of awareness and reach ownership. Uh, you just need to follow these laws. That's it. So you get more examples of things. The more you understand something, as you understand it better, you become, oh, wow. I, like now I really understand what that means and I feel confident using it. That's when you own the language. That's where you become a native or fluent speaker of that language. So you understand a specific word or phrase. You feel confident that you will use it correctly and you do use it correctly. You have ownership of that. If you have questions about it, these are the things you need to apply. So either get more examples, more associations, substitutions, uh, try to figure out how you could extend it to something else. All of these things will help you make stronger connections with the vocabulary. Okay, and that's when you can use it fluently. Uh, can you explain more details in real life example of inquiry? Well, like if just look at look at the look at the question you just asked right there. So you're you're uncertain about something and you're looking for more information about it. And this is uh, inquiry just like it, it applies to to anything like your brain is naturally doing that you just did that with your own question so I could ask about the history of something I could ask what the opposite word might be I could say like what like a uh, um, like if I like what would be a, a casual way of saying this like how might a casual restaurant say something rather than a uh, like luxury restaurant or something more expensive okay so when I'm asking those questions, this is me just, it's looking for even more information to, to understand vocabulary or to expand my vocabulary. But inquiry is just for like any general questions you might have that help you understand the vocabulary better. That's the idea. Uh, thanks again, we appreciate your time in teaching, says Jacinto, it's my pleasure. When will the next live lesson be? I think, I think, now I thought this last week, but I was wrong, I think it's next Friday. I think. But if I'm not here, don't be mad. <laughs> so don't plan your schedule around me. Let's see. All right, Neil says, thank you for 100 minutes. That was great. Yes. <laughs> that is a long, a long time. It flew by. All right, uh, you have any thoughts on, let's see, on basketball, Michael or LeBron James? I'll assume you pick Jordan rather than LeBron James because Chicago loves MJ. Uh... The, the reason I like Michael Jordan, or I would, I would pick Michael Jordan over LeBron James as, as, you know, the best ever, is because Michael Jordan is like, he's just, he's just tall enough. So he's six foot six, I think. So I'm like six, like six or six one. So Michael Jordan is like, where would he be? He'd be like, you know, a couple, couple inches uh, taller than me, I guess. Uh, but like Michael Jordan, he's, He's not, like, if you imagine a basketball player that's 10 feet tall, just imagine that. And the guy had, like, 100 points. He could just stand at the, at the basket and just dunk the ball in all day. Like, that wouldn't be a great basketball player, he's, even if he has more points than everybody else. But someone like Michael Jordan, it's like, he's, he's almost like a kind of, a kind of Superman version of, of regular regular people so reg like i could play basketball and like but he has he's not super tall um but yeah like he just so lebron is i think six eight and just a bigger guy in general like physically bigger than mike but like mike is he's like kind of crafty and to see some of the plays that that like mike did because i was i was you know growing up in chicago when mike was uh was was playing and yeah, just to watch like some of the moves that he did and how he faked people out. And he wasn't, and these are like larger players, but he was still, uh, he was still doing people. So I would, I would pick him as like a better, better all around um, player. But it would be interesting to see them uh, play against each other. America's Chinese food, not authentic to Asian George. <laughs> yes, I imagine that. And, and it's the same thing anywhere, really. Like you can, you can go to get Japanese food in America and it's, you know, like, California rolls and stuff like that is quite different from regular Japanese sushi or whatever. All right, Karina says, you're great. Thanks a lot, son. You are an amazing teacher guy. <laughs> a teacher guy, I like that. Uh, all right, uh, yeah, I only understand his English. If you're referring to me, I understand. Okay, I think I got you. All right, look at that. We got to the end, uh, only 107 minutes. <laughs> 
but thank you. Uh, hopefully this makes sense. I was excited to do this video because it really covers everything. And you can ask yourself these questions about vocabulary. Like, if I don't really understand something or if I'm still trying to translate, I should probably get more examples of that thing. And then I should figure out, once I understand the vocabulary, how else might I say something? So there could be times where you learn something and you don't really understand it, but you understand the situation. So if, I, if, I, like, if someone is describing a beautiful sunset, and one person says beautiful, another person says uh, like breathtaking or something. And maybe I forget the word breathtaking. It's okay. Like I can kind of understand like, oh, it's taking my, like <gasps> it took my breath away. It's breathtaking, you know, something amazing like that. So even if I don't remember a particular word, I can usually think of some kind of substitute. Uh, but you're able to do that more in English. So if you do that by trying to translate things, it will be much more difficult for you. Uh, come to China of a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe I will. Uh, I've never been to China, uh, but I would like to come someday. Anyway, uh, go back and watch this video again if you are joining us late or if you'd like more examples. But remember the basic idea is we want to make associations within the language itself, just like you're already doing in your native language. So you can do this. You're doing it already and it works for you. You're already getting fluent. You already speak well in your native language. Just apply the same rules into English. All right. Have a fantastic day. Uh, if you would like to learn more about pronunciation uh, or even just all of this stuff, all the things like applying all this stuff, I do that automatically for everyone in Fluent for Life. I just like do all the hard work for you, making it uh, easier for you to understand and become a fluent speaker. So if you'd like to learn more about that, you can cl click on the links in the description below this video. All right, I could listen to you for hours on end. It's so interesting. Well, glad to hear it, MC. Uh, thank you for the stream, says H. Ray. Well, thank you all for joining me. Papu, thanks, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.